think so. Jerry, you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Today is February 12th, 2016. My name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing Tash Smith in the Oklahoma Conference Ministry Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. This interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and in the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. And it will also be available on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Uh, Tash, thanks for taking the time to come back a second go around on interviews. Um, and my first group of questions uh, are deal with uh, with some of the major overarching things that we didn't get a chance to cover last time. Mm -hmm. And I want to get your, your thoughts on those, okay? Mm -hmm. First of all, on assimilation, why did the, the missionary work of the Methodist Church and, and other churches as well assume the necessity of assimilating Native Americans into Anglo-European uh, culture? And we why did the church feel that it was necessary to... Turn in just a little bit more. Sorry, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, that's better. Okay. okay, sorry, go ahead, Jim. Start the question over? No, Whatever. they heard it, just so he can hear it. Well, we're just... We're, why were they... Of, why, why did the uh, Methodist Church assume the necessity of assimilating Native Americans into Anglo-European culture? And tag one question is, why did the church feel that it was necessary to, quote, kill the Indian to save the man? Uh, when it comes to assimilation, I think the general attitude of Americans in the 19th century, not just Methodists, but all denominations really, believed that to Christianize was to civilize. And so what they mean by this is you must be Christian and you must be civilized. So they don't separate the fact that they are Americans or Anglo-Americans and their identity from the fact that they are Christian. To them it's the same thing. So therefore when you reach out to new communities such as Indians, the emphasis is not only on the Christianity aspect, but also making sure they have assimilated to your ways. And so I think this is a problem indicative of all missionary work at various stages. Uh, it's certainly in the 19th century because this is coupled with the belief that Indians as a people are dying out. And so the idea of, of killing the Indian and saving the man was in their minds a, a, a positive way of trying to save Indians who, whether it be biological inferiority or cultural inferiority, would eventually die out over the course of the 19th century. And can you cite some examples of extreme Methodist missionary measures and injustices that, 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 that inflicted on the, uh, that inflicted physical and emotional trauma on Native Americans? Much like all other denominations working with an Indian territory, uh, you'll see evidence of Methodists perhaps in schools especially, acting rather harsh towards Indians, young Indians, young children, uh, in trying to enforce their assimilationist agenda. Uh, you have examples of uh, children coming to school and the first thing that happens to them is, is being removed of their clothing, being thrown into white Anglo-American clothing, having their hair cut, being renamed, all these cultural traumas that you're inflicting upon the children. Uh, and children really do suffer a big brunt of this because the feeling is that if you can convert children and if you can make children into Christians, then you are down the line doing the Lord's work. Um, and so there's great emphasis on, on taking children especially and removing them from their native culture. Cash, on dealing with the Native American spirituality, can you cite examples of Native American worship practices that the church condemned and sometimes took extreme measures against? specific examples is what you're going for. Um, when it comes to native practices and how the church reacted to them, uh, there's a constant push to eradicate them. Uh, you'll see this in the early days when it comes to things like the Green Corn Festival among the Eastern tribes, the five tribes. You'll see this later when it comes to things like the Sun Dance or the Ghost Dance or peyote use among Plains Indians uh, later in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, they'll try to marginalize members that do this. They'll try to re uh, reject or um, expunge credentials of ministers who are participating in these events. Uh, they're very punitive in that fact. Uh, unfortunately fortunately for Native communities, uh, you have individuals like Andre Martinez who understands the importance of being able to operate within both worlds. Uh, 
And so they are somehow able to manage being Methodist and being a minister while at the some, same time attending peyote events, attending these things and, and trying to spread the word that way. Do Native American converts to Christianity and Methodism teach them the right to live out their Christian faith in a manner that also honors their Native spiritual forms? Can you explain the, the duality of um, Native American spirituality and why it contributes so greatly to the contentious relationships? Well, I think the, the ego on the part of Anglo-Americans is to believe that their interpretation of Christianity uh, and their interpretation of civilization is the same, and that is the only interpretation that is necessary. Um, the struggle they will continually have if you think of language for a minute, uh, trying to literally interpret the message in another language is one problem. But how do you try to interpret or, or discuss ideas and concepts that are foreign to another, to another culture? Um, and so what Anglo-American missionaries typically don't understand is, is that Indians have their own sort of customs and attitudes that are not necessarily Christian, but they're not non-Christian either. Um, but because they're not Christian, it's easy to try to do away with them or expunge them. Um, and so when you see examples of language persevering, when you see examples of how uh, not just language but the way you describe things, uh, using terms like the Great Father, for instance, as opposed to God or Jesus, um, this is a way that you're communicating in a native culture that resonates with natives, but yet it sounds very foreign and very almost paganistic to Anglo-Americans. <coughs> you spoke of uh, our, era, our era, um, interview about marginalization of the Native American. Uh, can you explain ways that the uh, Indian Missionary Conference and the Methodist Church marginalized the influence and roles of the, the Native Americans in missionary work and other conference activities? Uh, how do they marginalize Indians? Yeah. Like said, the, the uh, Indian Missionary Conference and Methodist Church, how did they marginalize Native Americans? Mm -hmm. One way that, that the church would marginalize their Native members uh, is particularly limiting how much or how much authority they will have, uh, both within the church or within the conference or on a national level. Um, when you restrict and you, you try to create a, a strict code of licensing, for instance, many Native ministers simply can't do it. They don't have the training, they don't have the, uh, the texts, they don't have the Bible in their language, for instance, they don't have um, writings of John Wesley in their language that they can rely on and, and, and use. So this is more of a marginalization, marginalization through indifference on their part. In terms of actively trying to marginalize Indians, uh, I think you see that in, in when it comes to appointments at churches, and particularly um, churches that are more successful and therefore have more funds and more money and more prestige will always be given to white ministers, whereas the churches that exist on the fringes of society, the ones that are uh, suffering week to week and, and cannot support their ministers, these are ones that Indians get. The bar is lower for those churches, so to speak than it will be for the ones in major cities like Muskogee or Vanita. Um, let me think, well, there's another way you can marginalize Indians. What about education or training, perhaps? When it comes to education in particular, you can see how there's sort of the, the education of low expectations when it comes to ministers, or when it comes to Indians, excuse me. Um, there's an expectation that whites will be able to better learn the material and therefore you can spend more time and energy and effort on them whereas Indians as a whole are only suited for the lower rungs of society uh, becoming workers and laborers in this great American fabric. Uh, so when it comes to say religious education in particular there's not great emphasis there's not a lot of money spent on it um, and what is spent is very limited uh, and it's very uh, restricted to certain areas um, and then what benefits the church gets from that later, they'll exploit for white, white needs as well. Okay, uh, so a tag one question to that is, you know, one of the strengths of the uh, Methodist Church through the years uh, was its, uh, its organizational structure. And, and, you know, if you're one church in one church, two states away, you're still having the same kind of mm -hmm. liturgy. 
how did that work against the Methodist Church though in working with Native Americans? Did they, uh, I think I hear you saying that the preachers and the white preachers expected that the church be done this way, mm -hmm. this way and this way. Is that, is that a hindrance? When you look at the white migrants move into Indian territory, one of the things they're pushing is for a, a sense of legitimacy from their churches and from their communities. For, for whites, the structure of the church and the, the way the church is established, the, the districts, the conferences, the circuits and, and preaching places and all this, this provides a, a, a sense of uh, uniformity among the church across the country. Depending what, no matter what conference you're in, you know you're entering a church that has the same sort of values and attitudes. When they come to Indian territory, many white migrants are immediately wanting that same legitimacy from their church experience that they might have if back in Illinois or Kentucky or whatever it is. However, what they're finding is a church that's often dominated by Indian interests, where maybe the minister is Indian himself, where maybe parts of the services are being conducted in a native language. And they don't like this. They, they really don't. And so one, in, one interesting story to kind of show this, this attitude uh, in the 1890s, the Indian Mission Conference had its own newspaper, Our Brother in Red, much like all conferences across the country had their own newspaper. And it, it operates Our Brother in Red, it operates it as Indian Advocate, another time they have it titled The Western Advocate, but it's a conference newspaper that is supposed to tell the story and communicate among conference members. But in one annual conference meeting, the church comes out and says, or the conference comes out and says to its members, you need to stop buying copies of other conferences' newspapers. Too many members of the Oklahoma Indian Conference are buying papers from St. Louis, for instance. And they don't like that because they're not telling the story of what's happening here. Their white members are trying to reach back to other places. And so they're not really committed to what the work is being done here in Indian Territory. Given the record and the history, uh, can you point out catastrophic events and periods in the history of the Native American community that they've been, that survived and, and endured? And are, that literally, are you surprised they're still around? <laughs> uh, the church, the Indian communities, Indian churches, Indian congregations exist today because of Indians. Uh, this is time and time again you will see this, whether it be the era of removal in the 1830s and 40s where it's Indian members who allow the church to spread again, whether it be after the Civil War in the 1860s when it's Indian members, Indian preachers who go out and spread the church, whether it be after 1889 as whites move in and begin to take over churches, it'll be Indian members who help foster their own com congregations and their own communities, or again in 1918 when they create the Brewer Indian Conference. All of these major events during this time period, the reason the church exists is because of natives being allowed to minister to themselves and helping the church grow. And I think native churches in many ways are most successful when whites kind of take a step back and let natives take over. Let them conduct their churches in their own ways and in the ways that speak to them as a community. Um, not to say whites shouldn't be involved, but when you see certain ministers like J.J. Methvin, when you see ministers like Theodore Brewer to an extent, who allow natives to have more of an, of an active role within the church, the church thrives. When it's whites trying to dictate to Indians or to natives what the church should do, the church declines. And I think that's time, that's true time and time again. Can you explain how the Native Americans could leverage the power of tribal leaders to assert control of local Native American churches in their struggle? Particularly in the 19th century, the church had to really um, work together and almost in a subservient position to native governments. Um, churches aren't allowed to operate within native communities without their consent. They can't own property for churches or for schools without their consent. So they really are secondary to the natives in this sense. And this frustrates them because the church activity from their point of view should be done by their authority, by their control. And so continually in the 19th century, you see this, this headbutting, so to speak, between natives, native governments, 
and uh, the church. Um, from the Native perspective, many individuals like James McHenry or Samuel Chakota or uh, John Page, these are prominent Indian individuals within their community, Creek Indians or, or Choctaw Indians, who are able to sort of balance their role within the church as ministers or presiding elders, as well as being uh, official uh, representatives of their people, whether it be as principal chief in Samuel Chakotah's case or as uh, district judges or representatives to the House of Kings or whatever it may be. Uh, so they're able to parlay their experience and, and they serve a very important role because on the one hand they give the church a, a, a link into the community, but they also are able to keep the church from getting too much into the community. So they kind of serve as the, the boundary between the two. Revision of the answer that you gave earlier uh, about the uh, power of Native Americans in, in missionary work with other Native Americans. Uh, how, how did the, the, how did the Native Americans use uh, uh, preachers and interpreters in tribal language to, uh, to maintain control of the, of the message that they were putting out? <laughs> I, I guess I'm suggesting, did, did they control the message by those factors? There's a story I've heard told many different ways, but the story is essentially this. A white minister is preaching to an Indian congregation during a revival service. And during the first ser uh, sermon, he preaches and the interpreter interprets, and the reaction from the crowd is humdrum. The second service, same thing happens. The white preacher preaches, the interpreter interprets, and the, the reaction is fairly, fairly humdrum. Third time, the minister preaches to the crowd, the interpreter inter interprets, but this time something changes. The people rush forward to the altar, there's a, there's a great moment of God coming into the room, and the preacher is really taken aback by this. And so after the service, he goes to the, to the interpreter and he says, you know, I don't know what I did different. This was the, you know, the first two times I preach it, it's, it's rather boring, but the third time I get great, great acceptance by him. And the interpreter just looks at him and says, well, I didn't interpret exactly everything you said. So the idea here is that the interpreter is very important to the process, that he's able to communicate in ways that, that ministers, that those outside the culture will never be able to understand. But it's that internal ability to, to take these large, at sometimes very foreign and complex ideas and communicate them in ways that Indians can understand and that they can be receptive to. Switching over to, to discussion of the Plains tribes. Mm -hmm. Can you summarize the, uh, sort of the overall effectiveness of the uh, Methodist Church missionary work with the, with the Plains tribes? For much of the 19th century, from about 1840 to about the 1880s, uh, the Methodist Church was primarily concentrated on the five civilized tribes, the five tribes in eastern Oklahoma. And these were Indians who had a, a longer history of connection with Anglo-American society, they had more intermarriage between uh, whites and natives. Uh, they had adopted many uh, white ways, such as the language or dress or whatnot. So this had created sort of a baseline for what the church expected it could do among natives. But beginning in 1887, with the work of J.J. Methvin, they move among Plains Indians. And Plains Indians do not have that same history of, of connection with white society. They're fairly recent. Uh, inhabitants uh, of Oklahoma, of Indian Territory, having moved there uh, first with the Medicine Lodge Treaty in 1867 and then following the Red River War in 1874-75. Um, they, they have different cultural backgrounds, different attitudes. Uh, they're not as accustomed to Anglo-American ways. But from the church's perspective, an Indian is an Indian, which means that they should be able to achieve the same results with the Plains Indians that they were able to achieve over 50 years with the uh, eastern tribes. So what they encounter are tribes who are undergoing their own upheaval, being forced to live on reservations, from being more uh, nomadic, wandering the, the plains, being spread out throughout the southern plains to now being settled onto reservations in a part of Oklahoma that's not necessarily conducive for a lot of what they want to do. Um, and so this, this creates a lot of uh, physical Tension. It creates a lot of emotional, a lot of psychological tension between the two sides. Uh, there's also the various language problems that have to be overcome as they're now trying to 
spread Christianity among Kiowas or Comanches or Apaches or in some cases Wichita's or Caddo's. Uh, so these all create a new, new set of problems for the church, but it comes at a time when the church doesn't want these problems. It comes at a time when the church is becoming more and more dominated by white Anglo-Americans moving into the territory who are less patient and less tolerant of trying to reach these new people. You mentioned earlier J.J. Methvin and the Methvin Institute. Uh, can you explain the reason for his successful mission to the Kiowas, uh, Comanches, and Apaches? J.J. Methvin is a unique figure. Uh, I, I think most of us would look at J.J. Methvin and say that he's your typical missionary, someone who committed much of his life working among Native tribes. Um, but what I've realized and what I hope others realize is just how atypical he is. Most missionaries do not spend 50 years among a community. Most missionaries are gone after two or three years, either because the work's too hard, they're not getting enough support, they find whites nearby who are easier to deal with, they get sick, they die, whatever it may be. J.J. Methvin is unique, and I think what makes him unique is the stance he takes towards Indians and how involved they can be in the church. He doesn't approach, he, at first he does, at first he approaches it very much like most missionaries would. Methvin's background, he comes from Georgia, and until about two years prior to going to uh, Anadarko in 1887, his whole experience within the church had been running boarding schools back in Georgia. He, he had no experience among Indians, but yet in 1887 in Anadarko, he's a 39-year-old man thrust into the Indian field. And at first, he tries to act like many white missionaries would, which is dictate to Indians what you should do and expect them to convert. And this doesn't work. So what he realizes very quickly is that if he's going to be successful, he needs Indians involved in the process. He reaches out. He makes connections with important families, the horse family, for instance, Stumbling Bear. He makes connections with leaders. He allows them to have a say in the process. He will be very intolerant of certain practices that he sees as being anti-Christian. He is no fan of the ghost dance, for instance. He's no fan of peyoteism. But in other ways, when it comes to the role and the leadership these Indians can take in the process, the ability to, to preach at their own services and have their own churches and get paid for this from, uh, from the conference, these are things that he's ultimately supportive of. And so by the, eight, uh, by the 1930s, for instance, you have Methvin rejoicing that Kiowas now have uh, Kiowa music playing, that, that youth groups from Kiowa churches are meeting every other Sunday or one Sunday a month and celebrating in Kiowa ways, but celebrating Christianity. And this was something that was abhorrent to many white missionaries. There's an example of, in the early 1890s, of the government boarding school in Anadarko, where the, the superintendent of the school was known to be very harsh towards the students. And in one particular winter, three students ran away from the school, but got lost in a winter so snowstorm and died. And this enraged the Kiowa. They, uh, the, the superintendent had to be ferreted out of town before the Kiowa could come in and, and attack. Methvin understood that this was not the way to treat Native people. In many ways, he adheres to the same kind of assimilationist, assimilationist agenda that schools do. He expects them to cut their hair. There's a great story where Guy uh, Quitone, when he's a young student, explains how the first thing that happened to him when he showed up at the Methvin Institute was being held down by Andre Mont Martinez and having his hair cut. Uh, so in many ways, he does those same kind of traits. But he also understands that Native families are important. So you have other examples of where individuals, you know, they're sick and he says, look, we can't help you. Go home. Be with your people. Um, we won't, they don't use corporal punishment. They don't use physical punishment like the boarding schools of the government or other boarding schools might. So it's a much kinder atmosphere in that respect. Were there are successful missions to the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes? <laughs> Not in my book. Excuse me. Uh, among Cheyenne, oh, I gotta do that. Take your time. Drink your water. 
Yeah, I forget. There's really not much I can say about Cheyenne and Arapaho. Um, most Cheyenne, most Cheyenne and Arapaho work was conducted by Northern Methodists at the time. And Northern Methodists' attitudes towards Indians in the late 19th and early 20th century it was more of an afterthought. The church that's conducting most work among natives is going to be the Southern Methodist Church. The Northern Methodist Church, they're smaller. There's not as many members. They do have their own Indian Mission Conference. But really, their membership doesn't take off until after 1889 with the land run, at which point they're in a contest with Southern Methodists for churches. So you have these classic stories of the Northern Methodist Church on one side of the street and the Southern Methodist Church on the other, each one trying to outsing the other. This is where their focus uh, becomes not on the natives themselves. And hasn't the devastation inflicted on the five tribes by the Civil War and the Reconstruction treaties that followed in 1866 uh, had it prepare and hasten the way for the eventual opening of Indian territory to quiet settlers? During the Civil War, each of the five tribes, along with some other tribes in, in Indian territory, had signed treaties with the Confederacy. From the government's perspective then, this was treason, and therefore all treaties that they had in place no longer applied. So in 1866, as the government is also trying to reconstruct the South, they come into Oklahoma and they basically negotiate a new set of treaties known as these Reconstruction Treaties of 66. Uh, the treaties allow for uh, or require the Indians to accept more white missionaries, to accept more white schools, to accept the railroads, to accept the freedmen, these former slaves of the five tribes to become members. Uh, it really is a punitive series of treaties for the five tribes. In another respect, it also takes land in western Oklahoma back, it takes it away from the five tribes, gives it back to the government, which they then use to relocate Plains Indians like Kiowas or Wichita's or Cheyenne and Arapahoes. What this does is it speeds up the process of assimilation by requiring the five tribes to accept missionaries, by requiring them to accept the railroad, by requiring them to accept schools, they are in effect requiring Indians to speed up and become more like us. And so what you see in the 1870s and the 1880s is this continual push and the growth of a white population who become more agitated by the fact that they have less and less rights within native communities. In many native communities they're not, allo not allowed to own land which angers them. And so this does nothing but increase the pressure on more white settlement. Can you summarize some of the major events surrounding the uh, opening and allotment of Indian land and in Indian territory to white settlers and, and how it impacted the, the Native Americans? With the first land run in 1889, uh, you see an influx of white migrants to the unassigned lands, to what is now the center of Oklahoma, communities like Norman and Oklahoma City and Guthrie, for instance. The Indian presence in that land, the reason it was unassigned is that they had not given it specifically to an Indian tribe. So while there might be Indians in the land itself, um, there's no, it's not given to one tribe in particular. But what this does is it creates a, a, a force by which more and more whites are moving to the territory and it just spills over over the next several years. You see more land runs, 1891, 92, 93, 97. Um, land runs in 1893, for instance, for the Cherokee Strip towards northern Oklahoma. With each land run, the white population booms, immediately they create towns, immediately they create churches, and anything that exists prior to that, they try to co-opt to support their own communities. So Indian churches, Indian circuits, schools, all of these things that the church had established for Indians decades earlier, whites slowly and steadily begin to take over. And of course this culminates in 1907 when the, church, or when the state of Oklahoma is created by, by Congress. A year prior to that, the Indian Mission Conference ceases to exist and it's now renamed the Oklahoma Conference. Uh, and by dropping the term missionary and by dropping the term Indian, they have effectively changed their mission, changed what they were supposed to do, and adopted a, a term, a conference that is in all respects just like any other white conference in Oklahoma, or excuse me, in the country. <laughs>
by changing the name, they've effectively adopted a conference that's like any other conference in the United States. We have to be a lot of the land eventually to the Indians. And of course, in their whole history, the tribes have been helping them in the, in the commons. Uh, what were some of the uh, egregious acts committed by unscrupulous whites uh, to uh, basically cheat them out of their land? Oh, goodness. Once allotment comes to Indian Territory in the 1890s, you see a lot of unscrupulous activities by whites, sometimes members of the church, sometimes members outside the church. And there are numerous stories of young Indian children being adopted by whites in order to get access to their land, but then not much done to help the children. In some cases, the children grow sick and die, but the title then transfers to the adult adopter. Uh, so there's numerous examples of whites being able to use the legal system to get access to, white, to Indian land. Um, in other cases, you'll see them taking advantage of rent. Indians will have allotments and they won't or they don't necessarily care or they're not as invested in how much money they can get for, the, for renting the land out to whites. And whites know this, so they give them penny on, pennies on the dollar to get access to the land so they can farm or they can you know, have the right of way for a railroad or whatever it may be. I've got more, I can think of it. Guardianship? There's one famous example. There's one famous example of the world's richest Indian known as Jackson Barnett, a Creek Indian. Jackson Barnett, his allotment was rich oil land near the Cushing Field up by Tulsa. He didn't necessarily care about it. He was what we would call a full-blooded Indian who was more into the traditionalist ways. Uh, however, unscrupulous business officials get him label, labeled as an incompetent Indian, which means that then he has a guardianship over uh, his property and over the money. And so they're able to get a lot of the revenue that he would receive from the oil company. They're able to use that money for their own purposes. And so there's one example in particular where the local Methodist minister is very upset by this process, upset that unscrupulous whites are somehow getting the money. But he's not upset because they're taking advantage of poor Jackson Barnett. He's upset because his church isn't taking advantage of this at all. So he puts great pressure on the, the presiding bishop, use your connections with the commissioner of Indianus, Indian Affairs, can we please get a chunk of his money? They even at one point have an agreement among Methodists and Baptists and Catholics to kind of work together, but the Baptists go off and ask for the money first, and they're upset by all this. So again, it's not that they are upset that Indians are being taken advantage of, it's that they are upset that they're not getting a piece of the pie as well. And I think this happens in many places across Oklahoma. You mentioned earlier in your text about the dissolution of the, uh, the Indian Missionary Conference and, and merging with the uh, Oklahoma Conference. Mm -hmm. What was the impact of that on the Native American churches? When the Indian Mission Conference becomes the Oklahoma Conference in 1906, and then four years later when the Oklahoma Conference splits into the West Oklahoma and the East Oklahoma Conferences, this is a very devastating time for Indian churches. They are no longer separate entities. At best, they have separate circuits within these conferences. And quickly, you see the, the numbers of members, you see the, the congregations decrease, you see these circuits being diminished and diminished and diminished. And so by the time the West and the East Oklahoma conferences are created, essentially West Oklahoma conference worries about its Kiowa work, not necessarily the work it had been doing among Comanches or Apaches, but just Kiowas. And the East Oklahoma conference is conducting work mainly among Choctaws and Creeks. This is the time period where the work virtually disappears from Cherokees. And it's uncertain exactly why this happens. You do see attempts by Cherokee individuals that they recognize the work is being diminished, that they recognize that the work is disappearing. And in one case, one woman in particular uh, donates money specifically to the conference to help spur Cherokee work. But the conference isn't concerned about this. Indian missions for them is a 19th century. It's in the past. It's not the future. And so in this particular case, they take the money and they use it to pay apportionments and, and pay some of their responsibilities to the national church. And they don't use it for Cherokees. And this becomes a great cause of concern. What role did the bishops play in the, they were over the uh, Indian Missionary Conference when it was reconstruction? Uh, do, you, do you recall some of the uh, earlier bishops? 
during the 19th century, during this time period, when new bishops were elected, they tend to get the less favorable conferences. And in the 19th century, that meant the conferences further, that, that required the most travel that were further out. So there was a, a sort of seniority that worked among bishops. Uh, the senior bishops got the nice conferences in the Deep South. The new bishops got conferences like the Indian Mission Territory. And so, or the Indian Mission Conference, I should say. Let me back up. New bishops got conferences like the Indian Mission Conference. As a result, for much of the 19th century, there's this continual turnover in getting brand new bishops as their presiding bishop. And so you see some who have very little interest. Um, it's too far. They're not concerned with traveling out here. And then you get in, uh, individuals like Charles Galloway, the missionary bishop, who immediately comes out here and wants to spread the church and wants to expand the conference. And it's really Galloway who, who becomes the motivating factor to spread the Indian Mission Conference into the Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache and, and other areas as well. He's only around for a short period of time, but then again you, you have other bishops who come along later. Uh, bishop Edwin Mozon. This is the bishop who presides over the creation of the new Indian mission, the Brewer Indian mission in 1918. So he has a big uh, responsibility in sort of setting the laws and setting the rules of, of the mission when it comes to things like licensing ministers. And you see this particularly when it comes to the rules he establishes because he recognizes that the Indian mission operates in a different sphere than the regular conferences might. And so he tries to create rules that are beneficial to the Indian mission, but yet are not at all acceptable to the conference itself. Can you tell us a little bit about the, perhaps summarize some of the work of the Native American preachers and the missionary work in the uh, Indian Missionary Conference following the reestablishment, as you mentioned earlier, the, the Brewer and Indian Mission and the, the, the new uh, IMC at that time? Uh, Indian work after 1918? Said in a conversation that we'd reached this low point and it just about uh, stopped and was, was losing territory. Did it, when they recreated that Indian Mission Conference, did it change the trajectory of missionary work? When they create the Brewer Indian Mission in 1918, you start to see a rebirth of Native work and Native missionaries and Native ministers and Native congregations throughout Oklahoma. It's not a huge rebirth. It doesn't happen immediately. It takes time. But within this new organization, what's happening is you have a new generation of ministers. You have a generation of ministers who grew up on the reservation or grew up in Indian churches. And so they aren't the first wave of converts. They're more of the children of those converts or the grandchildren of those converts. So they're a little bit more adaptable when it comes to understanding the differences between the Anglo-American world and the Indian world. And so it's this generation that really begins to lead the church. Uh, individuals like Johnson Bob, the Cherokee minister who had attended uh, a Methodist school and was prominent down in southeastern Oklahoma. Uh, the Horse brothers, Cecil and Albert Horse, who had attended the uh, Methvin Institute as, as children, but then become uh, prominent ministers in their own right. Uh, later on among Kiowas. So it's really the generational change of the 1920s and 30s and 40s that they start to rebound. But this is also the time where the white church is really, uh, where the white church is willing to let Indian churches have their own room, have their own way to exist. They don't spend a lot of time on them because they don't see much importance in them. But in this apathy, churches are able to grow. What are some of the lingering critical issues and challenges facing Native American communities in the Methodist Church today? Uh, for example, you know, uh, health, alcohol, addiction, uh, uh, from what? Uh, what are some lingering? Well, Indian communities throughout the 20th century, it's been about trying to rebuild and rebound and persevere. When allotment happens in the late 19th and early 20th century, it devastates Native communities across the country, also in Oklahoma. It thrusts two-thirds of all Indians into poverty. Uh, and so the ensuing problems of that, the fact that they come from uh, 
a, a larger percentage of poverty, that they're more of a rural-oriented people as opposed to an urban orient, where they're cut off from some of the means. Uh, this has been a constant source of struggle throughout the 20th century. And so now you have higher rates of, of disease, higher rates of illness among Native communities. And these are challenges that they have to face. Does the Baptist Church have some culpability and for these conditions and the responsibility for addressing them? I think without question, the Methodist Church, but really white society in general, do have culpability in what has befallen Indians over the course of the 19th and the 20th centuries. Uh, this I don't see any debate about. Uh, it was many of the actions of the government and of reformers and of missionaries that were trying to destroy Native cultures. So in that respect, we do. But I also think that if we worry about just what happened in the past, we tend to forget about what we can do now and what we can do for the future. And so I think there needs to be a recognition by the church, by the membership, by whites in general, uh, of how they can help natives, not do for them, but help them be successful and find ways to empower them in that regard. Indigenous own acts and uh, the church uh, it's also been complicit in not speaking out against this United States acts of injustice and to native people throughout the history of our nation if, is there, from your perspective should the church have done more uh, than to remain silent and, and uh, allow the things to happen should the church have done more or uh, to stop some of the abuses over time, is that what you're asking? I do think the church could have done more. I don't think it would have done more to stop some of the abuses that were happening in the 20th century. I think when we, when we ask that question, could the church have done more to stop the abuse? We're looking at it from a modern perspective, and we're not understanding that there really wasn't the attitude at the time to stop the abuse. In hindsight, we can make a lot of judgments. I think what's important is that we understand how these events occurred so they don't happen again. If we can understand the attitudes, the apathy, the indifference on parts of many, if we can talk, uh, understand how, in some cases, whites looked at what was there for Indians and thought, I can use this for myself. If we can see and recognize that, if we can recognize that dictating to Indians about how to be Christian won't get the work done, if we can recognize the role that natives can play in the process, that will lead to a much more successful future. I think that's what we need to concentrate on. Does the reconciliation and repentance of the movement of the United Methodist Church address these issues? Does it come out of the that roots in these, these issues? I do believe the reconciliation and repentance movement among the church is trying to address some of these issues. Uh, but I've also seen natives themselves make the point of we can't concentrate on what's just happened. We need to worry about what's going on today as well. So it's not just a, a, a matter of recognizing the atrocities committed 100 or 150 years ago. It's recognizing that our indifference today can still further these, uh, these atrocities. From your, per from your perspective, uh What's the like of the future of uh, Orion Seal from Indian Missionary Conference and neighboring churches in Oklahoma? I believe the OIMC faces a lot of challenges in the 21st century. I don't think that's a question. Um, there's certainly financial challenges that many churches face. I think that their future will be bright the more that they are able to take control and do what they need to do. Uh, I think the constant error on the parts of whites, dating back all the way back to the 19th century, is assuming that they can do it better than natives can themselves. And so I think if you empower natives, empower the leadership to understand what their communities can do and to understand how best to serve their communities, there will be a much brighter future for the, for the OIMC. Is repentance enough to ask uh, how effective are actually repentance and will they heal past wounds inflicted in Native Americans? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I think the first step towards change and changing attitudes is making people aware of what happened. If we look at the acts of repentance as an educational lesson in terms of what came before, if we look at it as a way to help explain the world we live in today, we're able to affect more change and more positive change. So in that sense, I do believe it's effective. But if we assume that only the acts of repentance, that if we just do those acts and then the problem is solved, that's only half the, half the issue. That will not solve the problem. We need to uh, carry on. In your opinion, what's the legacy of Native American Methodism in Oklahoma, and, and what are some of your unique contributions to, to the church? I believe the legacy of Indian Methodism in Oklahoma is, is one of the reasons, and in my opinion, the primary reason that Methodism exists today in Oklahoma. I think this is an important thing that, that many white members of the church could look at and understand, is that for decades, before whites ever came along to Oklahoma, the church existed, the church established itself, and it thrived due to its Indian members. And even as whites came in and the church began to change, it was that Indian foundation that established Methodism in Oklahoma as other denominations or other religions started to move in. And so in many ways, the church that exists today owes itself to the work of early ministers like Willis Folsom or Samuel Chakota or John Page or James McHenry and all these other native ministers of the 19th century. If Native American churches in Oklahoma cease to exist, what would be the loss? I believe one of the, the greatness, one of the great aspects of Christianity is the way it can appeal to di diverse cultures and diverse people. And so I think there's great breadth, breadth in that. Uh, if Indian Methodism were to die out, we would lose a valuable piece of this greater puzzle known as Christianity. We would lose a valuable uh, culture and cultural expression in a way that Christianity is able to uh, move among people. And that, that whole attitude, that whole expression, those whole, the images, the songs, the languages, all those things would be gone. And I do think we'd become less for it. James, what, what topics should we not address that, that we should have uh, covered that we need to discuss? How much did we get into the 20th century? Not much. Not much. How far, how much do you want to get in the 20th century? Mm -hmm. um, and the effect that that may have had on the psyche of Native people and why that may have invoked some change in the late 1960s. And how could you? Yeah, sorry. I'm thinking how I want to frame this. Um, the 1960s was a, was a great era of social change in America. And it was a great awakening of multiculturalism. When you look at this in the context of American Indians, you see uh, a large expression of Indian act activism, notably events like the taking over of Alcatraz Island, where protesters attempted to reclaim land that had historically been theirs, but taken via treaty by the government. And the treaty had said that if the government was no longer using it, it reverted back to Indian control. So these sort of expressions are expressions of Indians trying to retake what was once theirs. A few years later, you see uh, Indian activists taking over the Commission of Indian Affairs offices back in Washington, D.C. You see the siege at Wounded Knee, a site of a horrific 1890 massacre, but yet now um, Sioux Indians trying to take it over and create a new nation, so to speak. What this does is it reaffirms in a very loud and vocal way that Indians are still here, they still exist, and they want to thrive in a new world. Uh, within the church, this is when the church begins to recognize in the 1960s and early 70s that Indians do exist, that we didn't wipe them out, that they didn't assimilate entirely, that we need to recognize their existence and we need to help their existence. Uh, 
And so you do see a renewed interest in Indians taking important roles within the church and within their missionary work. And eventually you have the creation of a new Oklahoma Indian Mission Conference out of this. Okay, so you moved some of the uh, empowerment uh, policies and moves about the church at this time, but the United Methodist Church. Uh, a little bit. Native American Conference plan, uh, mm -hmm. the Native American uh, uh, Caucus, uh, some of those. A little bit. When I start talking about that, I get into trouble. That's okay. Yeah. David talked about that some. Well, All right. Which is why we didn't have Native American here in the 20th century, not that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, another thing, tell me about how allotment worked and the role that the Dawes Commission played. We didn't actually throw Dawes Commission in there mm -hmm. anyway. In 1887, the federal government passes the Dawes Act, which allows for allotment of Indian lands in most of the United States, but not within Indian Territory. A few years later, they pass the Curtis Act, which allows for allotment within Indian Territory. The way allotment would work, most Indian land was owned in common, meaning that the tribe or and the members of the tribe owned all the land together, jointly, collectively. This was seen as un-American because in the 19th century in particular, the belief was that Americans needed to be individual landowners, that freedom and democracy were strongest when it was controlled by the individual farmer. And so there's great pressure to try to turn Indians into individual farmers in that respect. So when they pass the Allotment Acts, what they do is they take the grand total of all the Indian land for a particular tribe and they begin to parse it out, usually in sections of about 160 acres, perhaps less, 80, 40, or 20 acres, depending on widows and children and, and orphans and so forth. Uh, and any leftover land is then sold to the government, generally for pennies on the dollar. Uh, in Oklahoma, you begin to see the Dawes Commission coming through the various tribes in eastern and western Oklahoma and negotiating this process. And, and coming to a conclusion of how much money, how much land will be set aside, who receives allotment. And this becomes a very contested time because they have to officially determine who are members of the tribe and therefore who are allowed allotments. The grand total of this whole allotment scheme in the late 19th and, and by the early 20th century, again, leads to, to vast poverty. Um, it leads to disease. It leads to fragmented communities. Uh, as now these, these areas that were formerly entirely Indian in nature are now pieced out bit by bit and you have whites scattered among them. And so usually Indians become uh, the fringes of society in many ways. Okay, so also we talked about the loss of tribal sovereignty uh, in the late uh, 1800s. Uh, and we also talked uh, about tribal authority was one of the things that protected local churches. Was that also a devastating loss to uh, when they lost uh, tribal authority, the tribal governments were disbanded, that, that power that they used to have from the tribe was no longer there to support the local churches. Was that important? I think I'll frame it. As the white population increased in the 1880s and 1890s, and as allotment took over, one of the conditions was that tribal governments would eventually be eradicated, that they would disappear, that these Indians would eventually become absorbed and part of the United States. When this happens, you see uh, an important player, the role of Indian governments as mediators and negotiators for the church, this declines. And so now it's, it's yet another assault on Indian culture in one respect, but from the church's perspective, Indian churches no longer have that, that voice that they once did, because now the, the governments themselves are consumed with their own survival, not mu much uh, caring about the protection of the other aspects of Indian society. And eventually, by the 1910s, 1920s, these governments are gone. Mm 
one more quick topic uh, here in probably 21st century. We have uh, Indian gaming and casinos. How, does that change anything uh, in terms of Indian churches? Are their prospects better because we have so many lovely casinos now? <laughs> yeah, they, unless the church opened one. <coughs> I think in the, in the current, in the 21st century, one of the mistakes is to believe that all Indian casinos are successful and that they, they eventually become a revenue source that helps all Indians. And this is not the case. Some casinos do very well because of their location. Some casinos do not do well because they're, they're located on Indian lands that's in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so in terms of how casinos and gambling have helped Indian tribes, it, it's really a, a, an, uh, an unequal relationship. There's no, it, it's not the same for everyone. Um, but one of the things that I think from the white perspective we don't understand is we look at casinos as a way to make money, but native communities often see casinos as a way to help the tribe. And so it's, it, it, from their perspective, again, it's a way of trying to collectively help everyone who's a member as opposed to just ensuring the success of individuals. So this capitalistic men mentality that many Americans have about it doesn't cry, quite exist in the same form with the Native communities. Okay, one thing we have to talk to Alvin Deer, and he expresses his deep, uh, you know, his tears in his eyes when he talks about the condition of the Indigenous people, mm -hmm. and the uh, high suicide rates we talked about earlier, the poverty, the, mm -hmm. the uh, health issues. within the church or within outside the church room. Do you see any uh, expectations or hope that things will change, that, that more resources will be put in those areas? I think as long as mainstream society considers Indians to be something of the past and not as viable communities that can exist today, I don't see much hope for what can happen in the future. But if we begin to recognize that these people can be uh, useful and, and contribute to society, but do so in ways that are culturally significant for themselves, that they can keep their identity while at the same time adopting and adapting to our ways, I think you'll see much more success. If we can reach them through education and through missionary activity, but at the same time allow them control and autonomy during the process, they will be much more successful. One more topic. Mm -hmm. Monty, fine. Um, the whole thing about the constitutional conventions for Oklahoma, the state of Sequoia, the state of Oklahoma, um, I think the state of Sequoia had their convention and basically wrote the constitution, but then they said that, no, wait, we're not going to have two states, we're going to have one state. And so, too many Democrats. A lot of it gets um, uh, co opted into the constitution for the state of Oklahoma. Were there any of our Indian Methodists, especially since they were tribal leaders in addition to being Methodist ministers, who were involved in either of those constitutional conventions that we could talk about? And was there anything about the Constitution of Oklahoma that was either supportive or problematic for our Native American? Trying to think of specific individuals that were involved. And if there were any, and you can't think of their names and just want to speak about them generically, yeah. then we can throw on the screen. Johnson Tiger, I believe, was one. Them. Yeah. When they figure out who they were exactly. I believe Johnson Tiger. There we go. Was he one? Crud. Well, I'll be safe. Um, when it came to the push for statehood in the early 20th century, in the early 1900s, you do see the issue of whether Oklahoma and Indian Territory should come in as separate states or as one state together. From the federal perspective, there's great reluctance to add Indian Territory as its own state. Not only is it primarily Indian, but it's also a matter of, from a political point of view, you have a Republican administration who would be admitting two new Democratic senators plus Democratic representatives. Uh, 
So politics always play a matter into this. When we look closer at the, the dynamic between Oklahoma and Indian Territory, Oklahoma, in many cases, they want to join with Indian Territory because they see Indian Territory has a much better tax base and would help support Oklahoma. Indian Territory recognizes this and they don't want to join with Oklahoma. And so you do see a move for statehood, individual statehood. And there were several attempts at it in the early 1900s. Uh, a state of Jefferson at one point uh, discussed. Um, the most famous example would be the Sequoia Convention, where members from throughout Indian Territory, citizens throughout Indian Territory, gather to write a new constitution for the state of Sequoia. And some of these members are Methodist ministers themselves, both white and Indian ministers. Ultimately, the constitution they write is rejected by the federal government. And as we know, Sequoia never exists. But that constitution does serve as the foundation for the Oklahoma con uh, Constitution, which is written a few years later. In terms of how it benefits Indians, I don't think there's a specific way that we can discuss that. Yeah. Very good. Anything else, Jerry? Good. Great. Good.